One of the turning points of the 20th century has been the advent of electronics. Industry has made full use of it. Man's ventures into space depend on it. And in the world of the arts, electronics has opened the way for a new form of expression, electronic music. A brilliant technical advance has been put to artistic use so successfully that electronic music is now regarded as one of the most significant developments in American music since World War II. Composers who once wrote for conventional, instrumental, and voice combinations are eagerly embracing this new medium, and they are obtaining new raw materials for the sounds they use. But more important, they have developed new means of controlling and organizing their compositions as well, in order to satisfy a long-felt need for ultimate and total control of the process of composing music. Before we hear some of this music, we are going to meet the distinguished American composer Milton Babbitt, who will play us some examples of electronic music and describe for us the different ways this music can be composed. Mr. Babbitt is a writer, lecturer, professor of music at Princeton, a resident of New York City, and a man widely considered to be America's foremost composer of electronic music. Mr. Babbitt, what are the several ways that electronic music can be made? Well, as we shall see, there are three fundamentally different methods for the electronic production of sound, and thus one hopes music. The most familiar is that which centers around the properties of the tape machine, the ability of the tape machine to store music, sound, if you wish, in that particular form that we see before us. Now, when one deals with the tape machine, there are two possible methods of operating on a signal. The signal can be pre-recorded, or the signal can be purely electronic. We're going to begin with the unprepossessing recording of a door squeaking, such as this. And now we're going to see how the tape machine itself can operate upon this signal. Let me hasten to say that I do not regard this as a musical composition. It does show some of the procedures that composers who work in this medium have employed on perhaps more impressive signals. Listen to what happens when we change the speed of the tape machine. This changes pitch, also changes the tone color of that door squeak. And then we'll hear what happens as we splice, as we separate these sounds, making little rhythmic patterns of them, transforming them entirely as, if you wish, physical tape materials. Could something as simple as that become a composition? Um, it could the... become a kind of composition. I, for one, would probably not find it a very satisfactory one until a great deal more were done. But it is technically true that any sound can be transformed into any other sound by virtue of the tape medium. Now here we're going to hear a musical sound, the lowest note of the piano recorded in a normal way, transformed very simply merely to show again what can be done to pitch and to tone color by the tape medium itself. Now that was all done with a single sound. Therefore, of course, one can create by mixing 
a very complex texture, different textures, all from that single initial sound. Now, uh, do we have a, uh, a piece of music that can, uh, that demonstrates how this kind of technique works? Yes, the piece that we're going to hear, it's going to be the opening of a, wor of a work entitled Of Wood and Brass. It was composed by Vladimir Usachevsky, who, by the way, prepared the preceding examples as well. Vladimir has often worked with this particular method of pre-recording individual sounds from instruments, usually from instrumental sources, often from vocal sources, and then putting together his composition, literally putting it together by creating succession, transformation, mutation through these tape methods. The very title of Wood and Brass indicates the source of this particular composition. The wood is the xylophone, the brass are the conventional brass instruments, trumpet, horn, and trombone. We're going to hear the opening portion of this work. <laughs> Mr. Babbitt, was it tape that started electronic music? Is that what got it going? No, as it turns out, not at all, because it was obvious that one could create music purely, if you wish, synthetically, as soon it was, as it was realized that you could record music. Once it was clear that you could record sound, that you could record music in every sense of the word, in the most elaborate sense of the word, on a disc, it was equally clear that all of that music was contained in the undulating grooves of a disc. Therefore, you could have created the sound by simply incising grooves. Now, that's not a very practical method, but a much more practical one was that that was revealed by the fact that sound could also be recorded on the side of a film track, in a variable area film track. One could have drawn those, if you wish, waveforms and created all the sound that was recorded there and a great deal that could not have been recorded there. This was indeed developed to a very high degree of sophistication in the 1920s. But composers, for a good musical reason, apparently, were not aware of this, at least were not particularly interested in it. They saw no reason to spend valuable time, valuable energy on the merely possible. Now today, many composers find these possibilities and necessities for, again, deeply centrally musical reasons. The particular attractions of this resource correspond to their compositional needs. So it is true that after the Second World War, the fact of tape storage, combined with a much more fundamental fact, a concern with the control of musical time, with musical and compositional needs, led to this conjunction, which has, of course, gone far beyond the capacities of the tape machine or of tape methods. Well, now we've uh, heard how natural sounds stored on, on tape can be converted into music. What are the other ways of... Uh, well, the first music? way that involves exactly the same kind of medium, the tape medium, begins, however, from a purely electronic origin. In other words, not from a sound. It was never sound. It was electronic oscillations, and indeed an oscillator. And that was imposed on the tape, and the composer begins from that as his material, rather than from a pre-recorded sound. That is the kind of work we're going to hear now. Let us now hear a portion of Mario Davidovsky's study number two. We have chosen to illustrate its musical flow with dance. Our dancer in choreography is Judith Haskell. Mario Davidovsky's study number two.
Interesting recent developments in electronic music is the introduction of computer-produced sound. Mr. Babbitt, uh, what does a computer do for you? Is it composing for you in any sense? No, just as we are not speaking about performance machines, that is about electronic organs or, if you wish, amplified guitars, we are not speaking of composing machines in any sense. The computer and all of the devices of which we are speaking today, the tape machine and eventually the synthesizer, do that and only that which the composer specifies. And in detail, in a degree of detail and with a degree of precision and completeness that were impossible in the past and indeed unnecessary in the past. We are speaking now of sound produced by specifications given on punched cards to a high-speed digital computer. There is a program that was developed at Bell and later at Princeton, which makes it possible for the composer to specify normal musical instructions, as one thinks of musical instructions in terms of pitch, duration, and so forth. Feed these to a digital computer. This creates a digital tape, which is transformed in turn into a magnetic tape, which then is performable on a machine of this sort. We're going to hear a portion of a work, a very elaborate work produced by a computer, by James Randall. It is entitled Mudget, The Memoirs of a Mass Murderer, and therefore there is a text. Let me point out that when the voice enters, no one should infer that this was a computer synthesized voice. It was just a normal recorded female voice, then later combined with itself speaking. This is just a simple process of re-recording. There was no tape modification or tape tampering of any sort.